tricky place like Kashmir, where things can be taken away from you at any time. There were strikes, there were wars, there was all this. What they can't take away from you is your education. They cannot take your mind. So I think there's also not just as a love of reading, but I think there was a, it's a cope, it would start out as a coping mechanism. I think, you know, I think it was very much like, you know, a baby's blanket or something like that it was, it was a book. A book was a constant for me. And welcome to Outlook Talks. I'm Vinita, and we have with us writer and filmmaker Priyanka Matu, who has recently published her memoir, Bird, Milk, and Mosquito Bones. Hi, Priyanka. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, Vinita. Thanks for having me. Priyanka was born in Srinagar, and in 1989, when she was a child, violence escalated in Kashmir. She and her family fled. She has lived in the UK, Saudi Arabia, and several parts of the US. She's had 32 home addresses in the last 40 years. Give or take. She is now based in LA, where she lives with her husband, who is from New York, and her two children. First of all, I would like to talk about the title of your book. It's a very intriguing title. And uh, it sort of stays in your memory. And it's called Bird, Milk, and Mosquito Bones. So tell us a little bit about the title. So the title, you know, I had written, a, when I had sold the book, which was on proposal, I had proposed it as a book of sort of lighthearted essays about food and family. And when I started writing it, it became a bit more layered than that. You know, it wasn't just these kind of short comic essays, it became really, you know, an investigation of memory and what home means and all these sort of deeper things that I wasn't ready to confront, perhaps when I sold it. Um, and so by the time I was done with the book, I thought, well, I need a new title. The original title had been 16 Kitchens. Sounds like a fun book, right? So yeah. it wasn't the right title. And so I handed in the manuscript without a title. And I said, you know, give me a couple of weeks to go figure it out. And I knew that the key to the book was in the, I knew the key to the title was in the Kashmiri language, which I love very much. I'm very attached to it. I think it's very um, indicative of how, who we are as a people. I think quite sharp, funny, you know, oblique. Um, and so I really walked around for ages. I talked to my family. I looked through books of old uh, colloquial phrases, proverbs. I wrote down scraps on pieces of paper. And then I make, I came across this one phrase in Kashmiri. It's called bird milk and mosquito bones. Now we're a storytelling people. We are prone to exaggeration. And so bird milk and mosquito bones is a phrase used to refer to something that is so precious. Like if you're telling a story, you say, oh, this king had a palace and it was filled with bird milk and mosquito bones, even bird milk and mosquito bones. It's so rare and precious that the listener should question their existence. And it really stayed with me because um, it was a perfect symbol, I thought, of the house, of the house we lost in Kashmir that we built uh, carefully that we oversaw that we brought you know one dish one sheet one this one curtain one you know we carefully assembled this house uh, and when we lost it in 89 my memory of it is so rich and special and precious that I wonder I wonder if it really existed as it does in my memory and if it isn't what it was in my memory is that important or is it really about the stories that we take forward with us from those memories? That, that's something I wanted to ask you about. When you write a memoir, especially when you're writing about Kashmir and what was what happened to you there, what happened to your family, mm -hmm. how do you pick one memory is a very unreliable narrator? It's fickle, as we all know. And how do you pick and choose from all the memories that you have and put it together in a book? And how hard was it for you? to finally put it down in words. I really just wrote down the memories that A, had stuck with me, because to me that meant, okay, these mean something to me if over 40 years, you know, 30 years, I've these are the ones that are the clearest and the most significant in my mind. Let me figure out why. So I started with those, and I also started with the family stories that are told. 
Because to me, it's so interesting. I mean, we all have families that tell stories over and over and over again. So I started to investigate, okay, why are these the stories we tell? So it was a combination of those two things with my own memory. Why was it, why do these stay with me? And why do these stay with our family? And I just wrote down the stories and I started investigating why, 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 why these, why did they impact us? How have they impacted us? And so that's how the book sort of started to take. So there, there, there are very interesting family stories about a large cast of characters in your book. You know, your, your grandparents, aunts, cousins, the maternal gra grandmother's house where you used to spend a lot of time as a child. And then you describe your family trips to Pahalgaon. I really like, could visualize that. And how it was a very joyful place for you as a child when you were in Kashmir. And then how things suddenly turned completely. Hmm. So talk a little bit about your grandparents who were really a big influence in your life, especially your Nana Ji. Yeah. Who would My insist Nana. that, uh, you know, domestic work was a distraction for girls from their school works and he would really like chase away his daughters and his nieces and say go and do your you know do, do your reading not your, don't stand around in the kitchen so please tell yeah. us a bit about your and the role they played in your life yeah so in our maternal ancestral home is called Matamal. We call it Matamal. And that is our, you know, like my mother's side of the family where, you know, it's a, it's a joint family household. It was three families all together. So my mother grew up with 11 cousins. It's a very boisterous, wonderful home. And it was mostly women. Out of 11 kids, there were two boys. So it was nine girls. And it was very, the energy was very, very feminine, but it was run by my grandfather, who was a very masculine man. He was like an army guy, a professor, big mustache, booming voice, you know what? He had, he was very close with his mother, who was quite a character. I don't think I even got into her, but she was redhead. She would sneak cigarettes, you know, she was, she was a cool lady. So I think he really was quite close to her. And when she passed away, she said, make sure all these girls are educated, your sister, including his sisters, make sure that the most important thing is that they get educated. That is their way out. That's their way forward. That's the way forward. And I think that stayed with him, the strength of an education, especially in a tricky place like Kashmir, where things can be taken away from you at any time. There were strikes, there were wars, there was all this. What they can't take away from you is their education. They cannot take your mind. And so that was repeated often. And it was with the girls as well. It was like, you were not here to be someone's servant. You were not here to be of utility to someone. You were here to have your own brain and, you know, uh, feed that brain and then move forward in the world with your own confidence and your own your own personhood. So that was the, from the, from the head of Zeus came like that directive and it trickled down to all the women, um, including, you know, I was the first grand, he, my mother was the first child uh, of the 11 and then I was the first grandchild. So it went straight direct lineage uh, to me. So one line that stuck with me in your book was I've moved a lot, but I carry Kashmir everywhere I go. What does that mean? How do you do that? Yeah, yeah. I think that what I'm referring to there is, is again, we're a community, not just us, not just pundits, but also Muslims, like it's Kashmiris as a whole, have had such um, plot heavy histories <laughs> that I think it is just a value system that is passed down. The thing that I just mentioned about the the only permanent thing being our educations and our family bonds. Uh, because at any moment, I think we knew that other things could disappear. So everywhere I go, I carry the value system with us. And I think, and a sense of humor, hopefully about it. And, uh, and uh, just sort of, this is what we carry with us. And this is what we pass down. And of course, my affinity for the place, you know, I love the place and I loved our home, but it's really so much more about those intangibles. Uh, it's a culture that is, uh, you know, we hope, we try not to let anyone chip away at it. It's pretty uh, concentrated. <laughs> I also feel that, you know, you build a home in language. First of all, because you're a very good reader, like you were telling me that you're an avid reader. You're a writer. And the way you picked up languages along the way from your childhood. I yeah. remember that scene, that chapter in the novel where you first go to nursery in the UK and you don't speak a word of English. And they don't speak a word of Hindi. Nobody understands Hindi. And you mm. come home crying so badly that you vomit. You're this little nursery kid. And you mm. say, no one speaks my language and I don't understand what they're saying. 
But soon enough, you say that the new language, English, and you became inseparable. And your love of language led you to literature. So uh, did you find a home in literature? Who are some of your favorite writers? I, I started reading quite early. Uh, my mother says four. That sounds too early to me, but that's her story. And she's sticking with it. So we used to go to the library. That was, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. And I loved books. I love, she read to me a lot. She told me stories. And so that was a natural, I had a natural affinity for for stories. So I spent all of my free time at the library. I spent all of my free time reading and I, I loved it. I loved it, especially with all the moving and stuff. It was sometimes easy. Like you take a world with you everywhere you go. So I always had a book going with mean, the secret garden or whatever with me in my bag. So wherever I went, I could plug into like, okay, now I'm in the secret garden. Doesn't matter if I'm in some strange apartment in a strange land, I have my book and that is the constant that I can take with me. So I think there's also not just as a love of reading, but I think there was a it's a cope, it would start out as a coping mechanism. I think you know I think it was very much like, you know, a baby's blanket or something like that it was it was a book. A book was a constant for me. And um, so was music, I think. Right. And music, the yeah. My connect with music. There's that very interesting episode where you uh, listen to Ali Seti, the Pakistani singer and writer Ali Seti, singing Pasuri, the song mm -hmm. which we all love. And then you find him, like you contact him, actually, like you find the real Ali Sethi and you guys bond one of, he's, he's a first born, uh, like the son, and he was born in Lahore, you were born in Srinagar, and then how you born, tell us a little bit about that interaction. Yeah, I was at a writing uh, residency in the woods, in the middle of the woods, in the middle of winter. It was the first time I had ever been away from my kids for more than a few days, and really gave me the space to kind of explore what I might be interested in. And then I heard this song. It was right when it came out, right when Pazuri came out. And I was like, what is this song? I mean, the same response we all had to that song, which is like, I feel like I've known this song forever. What is this? <laughs> like, why, why do I feel like I've known it forever? I was writing a book at the time. So I was like, I need to write about this song. Yeah, I need to write about this process. And then I found him through like his sister and I had a friend in common, you know, it was like that, like a, then I found his sister. Then she introduced me. It was like a whole, it was a whole thing. But I got him on the phone and I talked to him and it really felt like we had known each other forever. The way he spoke about the song. I mean, I write in the book, his creation of the song, you know, and his also his background, his extremely traditional training in classical, classical, um, you know, uh, Hindustani music and all of this. And so, so it was fascinating to me how we built the song and how we, we ended up finding each other and really getting along. It was really, really beautiful how just loving, loving each other's art can kind of bring us together, especially in the internet age. The internet gets a lot of flack, you know, but how incredible that we were able to talk to each other and find each other through that. The other thing is food, Kashmiri food. You talk a lot mm -hmm. about it and you also mm -hmm. talk about this one place where you learn to make Rogan Josh via Zoom. Your mother mm -hmm. is in uh, Michigan and you are in LA and then she's teaching you how to make the dish and then you finally succeed in making it and now you yeah. want to feed it to your kids. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Kashmiri cuisine and your connection to it. Kashmiri cuisine again is another thing we took with us, another constant, right? Wherever we were, we could recreate our dishes from home. And it's a cuisine that doesn't veer much. I mean, there's a couple of Kashmiri chefs now who are sort of experimenting with different presentations. But we don't, we have our classics and we do our classics. And this is how it's supposed to taste. And don't mess with it. You know, like this is just don't, no experimentation, no nothing. This is pure comfort food. Like we've been through a lot. Eat your Rogan Josh. It tastes like Rogan Josh has tasted for thousands of years, you know? So, um, so that was one other constant, not just the book, but everywhere we moved. Okay. Like let's get the kitchen set up. Let's make some, you know, let, let's make some hawk. Let's make this, let's make that. This is the food you've always had. Here's another point of comfort, you know, and a touch point. So I am very attached to it. I, I always loved food. I was a big eater and I was like a chubby little girl. And I loved, I loved food. I loved being in the kitchen with my mother. I loved helping, you know, but this Rogan Josh was something she had always made me. I had never cooked it. Kashmiri food specifically was her domain and if I wanted it I would see her or she would see me or she would make some and send it home you know in a brick a frozen brick because we live across the country from each other it's a four and a half hour flight you know so um 
and it, during the pandemic, I obviously didn't have access to it. And I really wanted Roach. I missed her. I missed the food. And I said, okay, now you have to tell me. I've tried a couple of recipes. It doesn't taste the same. And like any Indian mother, she doesn't have a recipe. She just says, oh, I put in this much, it's red. And then it's, I'm like, no, 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 no. I need you to measure, you know? And she was grumpy about it. And I think also sad that to lose the connection of like, oh no, I'm the only source, you know? So we got on Zoom and she walked me through it. And uh, yeah, we figured, we wrote it down. We figured out how to do it. And and that was a big moment yeah. for us. You also say that um, it's, it's quite misunderstood, even by Indians, that Kashmiri cuisine. Why do you think that is? Because I think there's a little bit of a, uh, what's the word? I don't, um, there was a bit, it's a bit, it, there's a bit of a fairy tale mystique around a lot, a lot of things that are Kashmiri. So on a menu, you might say, ah, oh, like the elusive <laughs> Kashmiri Rogan Josh, you know? there's a little bit of like sparkle around it and it's never right. It's just never right. There's a reason we're so insular and protective of our food, of everything, you know, we, we are protective and insular people, you know, for a reason. We've been we've been sort of, you know, invaded by gangs of marauders since time immemorial. So we protect everything, including our recipes. So you That's see it on a menu and you say, is this possibly Rogan George? It's not possible unless it has this, 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 this. Tomatoes? No way. Not Rogan George. So is this memo a way of, you know, dispensing with the mystique? Like, are you trying to... Yeah, get closer to the a little a little bit a little bit um and it wasn't just for me I didn't write this book for me I didn't want to write a book about myself but I love my people I love my Kashmiri people I love my community and uh I was just tired of everything all the headlines being about stuff that had happened to us this kind of like victim mentality which I understand why it exists but the idea that every time I read about Kashmir was like, here's this horrible thing that happened to a bunch of Kashmiris this week. And I was like, you know, we have some joy too. We have some things to present other than pain and suffering and, you know, all this. And we're sort of held at arm's length and pitied uh, in a big way. And often, you know, I tell people I'm from Kashmir and their faces kind of fall like poor thing. And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm great. I've been, I've been very, very fortunate of course, some people have not been as fortunate. I understand what a privileged position I hold, but those people who are less privileged, who have been living in refugee camps, who have been under any kind of like cartel for like 20 years, they are not able to write this book. I was able to write this book because of like some fortune that I've had, right? So let me just represent one family and hopefully you can see a more complete picture of what one Kashmiri family looks like. That's another thing. You call your upbringing danger adjacent yeah what does that mean you always feel like you're even like you're saying you're from a privileged background you were able to move you were able to go to school in Riyadh and then study in the UK the US etc but yeah. what is this adjacency to danger that you feel there were always things happening but we were never in the middle of it so even I mean when we were there's a bit of a timeline shift but when we were in all of the Kashmir stuff happened when we were in Riyadh. So we were not in Kashmir. So we have just narrowly missed a lot of the actual, you know, guns, bombs, yeah. all that stuff, you know, but it, it was always That's just violence. Yeah. What I felt was like, again, our family was a unit. We were protected. My parents did everything they could to protect us physically, emotionally. And then just outside there were dangers, you know? So like, Anything could happen just outside if we had just been, my God, in the wrong place at the wrong time. I talk about that time we went to Jammu and the movie theater blew up. That stuff, that was the kind, that was one example. But that kind of stuff was happening all the time. And so but I always knew was just your mother there. and you. You, you, you were living yeah. in Jammu at that time. And we weren't, we were visiting Jammu at that visiting, time. And uh, it was considered safer, obviously, compared to. Mm -hmm. yeah. but a bomb went off in the movie theater and you say this was supposed to be a safe place so yeah, yeah but we were supposed to be at that movie we had bought tickets to that movie and then it didn't work our you know we went shopping something ran long and then the bomb went off and we were supposed to be there so those kinds of incidents were always happening so while they didn't happen to me knock on wood there was always a sense when you're a child and people around you are dying that does infuse you with something you know it's sort of like oh an understanding of how the world can be
but does it also make it make you stronger in a certain sense like your children you call them very californian like they've grown up there mm-hmm. they consider that home and they have obviously have had a much brighter you know uh, perspective on life the way they've lived but uh, what is the wisdom that you have gained from you know your danger adjacency i think there's there's two ways to read it right either either it makes a child a it kind of makes a child a fatalist like a little bit like everything can disappear at any moment there are good and bad things to feeling that way one is it one is I have perhaps like an unusual kind of allergy to objects and <laughs> places. I don't buy things. I don't have a lot of clothes. I don't have a lot of, you know, the house is the house. How We have a house. That's great. But I don't buy things. I have a, I have a very hard time getting attached to any physical objects. I just don't. Um, because there is obviously in the back of my head some idea that, oh, what's the point? They can just be taken away or they can disappear. Things happen to objects. Um, but on the other hand, I think it makes me much more proper probably grateful and mindful of like every moment and how precious it is uh which again can swing into anxiety I think because you know it took me a long time once I had kids to kind of hug them and be able to let go of them even at school I'd be like oh god what if something happens oh god oh god oh god so it it takes a while to let go of that alarm bell in my brain and I still have it sometimes so um so that's you know the anxiety that comes I think with a with a sort of a lifetime of that takes a while to rewire. Um, But I think I am very, very, very grateful for every moment we can spend together, for everything that I have, the fact that I have like a stable family life, a stable, uh, uh, a stable profession, you know, a stable marriage, like all these things I'm so, so grateful for, because I know how lucky I am. I know how rare it is for all of these things to fall into place that I should be here. It feels like a wild stroke of luck. And what is home? Like in your head, when you think of home, what is home? Or is it multiple places? Or is it just memories? Like, you know, that at one point, I think you say a web of memories suspended in time. So Mm -hmm. for you, like what, if you were to pinpoint a place, what is home? Is it England? Is it the Kashmir? Where where you think, you know, you have so many memories of? It's hard. Or is it where you are right now? I thought that when I finished the book, I would have some sort of answer. And the answer that I can that I came to in the book is that I don't know that there ever will be one place that's home for me because it was so fractured growing up. But I am very attached to a, a number of places. At the same time, I don't feel roots in any one place like my kids feel here. So I think my job now, as I see it, is to make sure that they feel connected to this place so that they know for them what home feels like, Um, even if it's not home for me. It's too late for me, (laughs) you know, like I'm just going to feel, I think, forever sort of comfortable and uh, uncomfortable wherever I am. But I think my kids, you know, my kids a few more years here and they'll I think they'll really feel like it's I think they're always going to feel like What do you tell them about Kashmir? You talk to them about... Well, my daughter's quite small, so she doesn't understand any of it. But my son is almost 11, and he's read the book. And he's seen... He's read the book. He's seen photos. He understands He understands all of it. So we talk quite a bit about that. He'd like to see it someday. And you, he hasn't been there? No, not yet. I'm not ready. And yeah. also about making friends. You talk about... You know, someone asked you, what instrument do you play? Once and you said that, I play people. What is this gift? And how do you do it? I don't know if it was a gift or a skill developed over time. You know, being the new kid in so many places, I spent a lot of time sitting and observing human behavior. Trying to understand it, codify it tap into it, understand how I can mirror people and connect with a wide variety of people across the globe, Uh, different ages, different backgrounds, all of that. So now it's an instinct. It was something that I had to do to learn to do as a young person. And now I don't even think about it. Um, It is something though. I do reach out. My kids are very friendly as well. And I hope that I had something to do with that. Because not everyone in Los Angeles walks around talking to strangers, but I do because I'm like, that's life. 
that's what that's what life's all about is an interaction with someone a shared moment of humanity you know I think in too many of these cities you just walk around in your little bubble and like live your little life but what's the point if you're not connecting with people and, and so yeah I, I, it sounds much more um it sounds much more malevolent when I say I play people like an instrument <laughs> but I do understand people and that's because I'm curious about people uh, and I have a lot of data points. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for talking to us. And good luck for your new, new book. I hope Thank you. Thank you so much. Well.